So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third installment of the COVID-19 ASB webinar series. Uh, we intend to discuss through this series um, issues and insights on the themes related to COVID-19. So in today's webinar, we will discuss on the supply chain considerations for two of the critical industries, medical services and food supply. So welcome to everyone. And we will probably start in next one minute as the participants trickle in. And basically we hope from these conversations today, we can trigger some ideas and also insights and feedback on how we can approach these challenges more effectively. Okay, so on this panel for today, I would like to warmly welcome our two panelists. So let me stop sharing the screen so that we can see Professor Fine and Alok on the screen. Um, Professor Charles Fine is our President, CEO and Dean of ASB, and he's also the Chrysler LGO Professor for Management at MIT Sloan School of Management. He's also the Co-Director of the International Mot Motor Vehicle Program at the MIT Sloan. His area focuses on supply chain strategy and value chain road mapping. Thank you, Professor Fine, for joining us today. Thank you, Zelina. And with us today also is Mr. Alok Mishra, who you can see having a you know, really nice vacation by the San Francisco area. See, he's a CEO of Value Edition, uh, focusing on helping med tech company building capabilities and strategy in marketing. He's recently retired after 20 years in Johnson & Johnson as a senior manager physician. And his last role was VP for strategic capabilities Johnson & Johnson Medical Asia Pacific. Welcome, Alok, to the Thank you, session. Thank you. Okay, so uh, just quick logistic um, uh, information. Before we start, we I just want to announce that this will be a 45-minute session where we'll invite the, our two esteemed panelists to share their framework and their insight for about 30 minutes or so. And then we will follow up with a, about 10, 15 minutes Q&A. And please make sure that you can put your questions in the Q&A box down there, as you can see the Q&A. And we'll try to process this question as batch. And we hope we can try as best as possible to answer all your questions. Okay, so let me start with Professor Fine. Um, based on the Asian policy report last week, uh, as of 9th April, um, there were about 15,500 cases in ASEAN for COVID-19. I mean, that's, that's just huge, but not as big as what we've seen in the, U in the US and the Europe, but the numbers keep rising. Um, so we know that, and we've all experienced here individually that as the numbers of cases rise, that each government started to implement the restricted movement control order. And that affected also the supply chain for uh, the food. And we all know, right, in terms of food security, that's one of the utmost importance to all of us because of the livelihood. And the disruption on food supply chain will really cause, potentially cause social unrest. So we felt it's very important to cover that topic today. Um, and I can also share that in terms of panic buying right before the MCO, we all saw that and because of hoarding and, and what it affected or well, how it affects the food supply chain. So I want to ask you whether we, you can elaborate in terms a bit more on the supply chain challenge and how do you look at them? And let me share the slide before you start. Okay. Right. Thank you, Zelina. So, uh, and also thank you to all the per, uh, people who are logging in and listening into our, our program today. Uh, I want to share just a tiny bit of uh, theory on supply chain with this little fulcrum that, fulcrum, that uh, we might think about what kind of challenges we, we are seeing in the COVID situation and supply chain. And, and I put here, well, maybe there's not enough supply or maybe there's too much demand. Uh, and uh, if we have too much demand, obviously that's going to cause uh, problems. And if we have not enough supply, and if we have both, that's in, uh, that's going to double our problem. So maybe the next slide uh, shares a little bit. So so first, let's let's think about demand. So Zelina, you mentioned panic buying and and people hoarding, and so how do we think about that? And, and so, in fact, 
there's a whole theory of supply chain and theory of inventory that says uh, if uncertainty increases, uh, it's, it's natural and normal and optimal for organizations and people to increase their safety stocks. That is, uh, if you don't know whether you're going to have enough food to eat next week, then you might want to sit, share, uh, store two weeks worth of food rather than one week that you might normally have. So, but if everybody does that, obviously, we have a significantly uh, uh, greater demand than we had in the past. So on the one hand, individually, it might make sense for each person to buy a little bit of extra, but collectively, when we all buy a little bit of extra, we get a, a very, very large increase in demand. So that's one of the challenges that we face. The second challenge is, is that the, sh the shift in the usage of, of uh, food, as an example. So uh, I don't know the data for Malaysia, but in the United States, only 50% of all food is, uh, is, uh, ends up in people's homes and consumed in people's homes. The other 50% of the food supply chain ends up supplying restaurants, uh, entertainment venues, uh, 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 places like uh, Disney World and baseball parks and all kinds of places like that. Uh, and so uh, now we've got a shift where instead of 50% of all food being shipped, consumed in the home and 50% outside the home, now 100% or close to 100% is being consumed inside the home. And that affects the supply chain because the supply chains, uh, there, there are often separate supply chains to, to uh, support industrial users like restaurants uh, as compared to home users. And also the packaging is different uh, and, the, and the products are often different. So we have uh, this shift in usage. All of a sudden, there's a growth perhaps of almost doubling of the amount of food that people want to consume in their home because they're not consuming outside. And so that uh, multiplies the effect that we see from the first point. So people are increasing the amount they buy because they want more safety stocks, and they're also increasing the amount they buy because they're actually going to consume more in their homes uh, than, uh, that, and not consume outside as they normally do. Uh, a third reason that you get more demand is that because people perceive the cost of being short is higher. So I'll use a medical example rather than a food example for this one. But uh, in normal times, if you run out of face masks, it may not be a life and death situation. Whereas in this COVID situation, running out of face masks could be a life and death situation, particularly for medical workers. And so the cost of being short increases. And so if you, the cost of being short increases, you want to lower your probability of, of running short, and so you buy more. So, so, so we, what we're seeing is that all three of these effects are going on and influencing our supply chain and driving a greater amount of demand on the supply chains that we have. So that's the first thing I think that, that's worth maybe trying to understand. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide is all about supply. So, so how do we think about supply? And so I, I have a little food example here. Maybe it's, it's simplistic relative to the complexity of many food supply chains, but it gives you the basic idea that we want to look at the whole supply chain. We want to find the weakest links or find the bottleneck. So we can think of the food supply chain as including uh, planting and tending, uh, then harvesting, then some kind of marketplace where, where the farmers actually sell to wholesalers, then there might be transportation to a warehouse or a factory. At the factory, we may see food processing or at the warehouse, packaging and repackaging. Then we see transportation to a retailer, uh, then some amount of unpacking and putting in displays, then consumer purchase, and then last mile to the consumption point, which might be uh, the consumer uh, buying it and delivering it home themselves, or it could be something like Grab uh, bringing the, the, uh, d doing the delivery. So we have, uh, we have this multi-step supply chain, and each of these links uh, potentially has risks. It potentially has needs that we, where we need to look at what are, what are the challenges. So, so planting and tending tends to be labor-intensive. Oftentimes, those laborers uh, in many economies are migrant laborers. Uh, some of those people uh, are often housed in places where they're, where they're packed tightly together, they may not have the facilities where they can wash their hands and, and sanitize in the way that we can if we're at home. And so you've got risks of uh, illness in the people who actually do the planting 
tending, and harvesting. When, when, when the food goes to market, there's a marketplace where there may be many buyers and many sellers in that marketplace. So people are coming together. If we're in, uh, uh, imposing social distancing, those markets may not work as well, and we may have challenges there. Transportation to warehouse or factory. So sometimes the transportation is by rail. Sometimes it's by truck. Uh, in either case, uh, we have the risk of the the, the workers, so these are workers who cannot work from home. Uh, they have to work uh, on the job, if you will. So, uh, and oftentimes they can't completely social distance in the way that they operate their transportation system. So, so, so we have risks there and extra management needs to, to uh, enable pe these people to be safe uh, with masks, with sanit sanitary processes, with social distancing. Uh, then processing and packaging. Some, some processing and pa packaging facilities are, are very machine intensive, so not a lot of labor. So you can have social distancing, but others are very labor intensive. You have lots of people working together in a closed space. And there, again, we have risks. And if, if the operators of these facilities are going to practice social distancing, they may have to slow down and reduce the quantity of, of work that they're able to process. Then again, we have transport to retailer, maybe by truck, maybe by, by rail, maybe other ways, but same kinds of, of challenges and risks. Then you have unpacking at the stores, uh, consumer purchase, and already we have data from uh, some countries where grocery store workers have become ill and some of them have, have lost their lives due to COVID working in the grocery store. And then we've got the last mile to the consumption point. So we have many steps along the chain. Each one of these has a certain amount of cost, uh, requires a certain amount of touch, uh, requires uh, logistics, planning, labor, et cetera. And to assure the supply chain, we have to assure each of these links. So it's not good enough to just look at some of them. We have to look at all of them. And we want to try to find the weakest link, if you will, make sure the weakest link uh, is strong. So. Uh, so this is, uh, in some sense, the challenge of, of it's a long, complex chain. Uh, each step has costs, and these costs are going to increase if we have to impose social distancing, uh, greater care for the, the, the labor and the, and the processes. Uh, can we replace uh, people with technology? Well, maybe somewhat, but, but this tends to be food supply chains tend to have a lot of physical movement. Uh, and... And it's not, you can't digitally deliver food uh, to customers. You can have digital orders, if you will, maybe digital marketplaces, but there's a lot of physical touch that goes on. Uh, and, uh, and that's going to be uh, a challenge. And now, uh, to add to that challenge, what I said earlier about increases in demand, that is, uh, we've got uh, potentially because of people ordering more, because of the shifts in the supply chain, because of the higher shortage costs, these supply chains are being asked in some sense to carry more uh, weight, to carry more volume, to carry more business just at a time when uh, they're having to redu reduce their capacity because of social distancing and safety. So that's gonna put stress on the supply chain. And I'm, I'm gonna pause here uh, having sort of laid out the challenges and after uh, Zelina and uh, and Alok have a chance to share some of their thoughts. I will uh, I'll say a little bit about maybe what some of the solutions are to how to address these challenges. Thank you, Charlie, and thank you for elaborating the supply chain because for and I, I agree with you in terms of the food supply chain. There's still a lot of physical involvement to push through the whole chain, and I think that's going to be a new innovative solution that will come out from this COVID-19 in terms of how we can manage that with, um, with all this low touch and social distancing measures that we have to do. Um, and maybe we can come back into, uh, before um, after this uh, with a question and answer, and you can help elaborate a bit more. But uh, for now, I think I just want to go to Alok. Um, and in terms of the medical services, uh, we have seen in, um, you know, right now in the US, um, even in Malaysia and Singapore with the second wave coming, 
um, it's so important to flatten the curve and, and implementing all the measures to reduce mortality. Of course, one of the most critical thing is to make sure the medical supplies and the PPEs, the ventilators, get to the right patient at the right time. So, and you know, in terms of, Charlie has explained the the, the weaklings um, theory and framework for the food supply chain. So my question to you is, can you share a bit more? What do you think in terms of the medical supply um, medical supply chain and what do medical providers need to be thinking about? And the second follow-up question would be from that framework, maybe you can share a bit more the different practices by the different region and different countries. Thanks, Alok. Thanks, Alina. And thanks, uh, Charlie, for having me on this panel. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. So what I'd like to do first is uh, uh, try to put before you uh, the complexities of uh, the medical side of the equation. You heard about the food side, which is complex enough, I think. But when I think about the medical side, it is, uh, it, it, it's, it's a bit more complex. And not just complex, it has two additional elements of being first time that the world is looking at something like this and the sheer magnitude of, of the problem being global. So let me talk about this framework. This is a four A's model that created uh, uh, to, to try to understand medical device markets or medical markets. Uh, because this, when it comes to healthcare or medical uh, practice, it's not a product supply. It is a service supply with different products which come around that to serve the patient. So the patient is at the center and services and products are around that. So what are the elements of that? The first one on top, which I put there is called access, which means uh, do I as a patient or as a, a government have access to what I need to treat the patient? And there can be two types of things here. One could be the capital equipment, and then there are the consumables. To give you an example, capital equipment would be, do I have hospitals? Do I have uh, uh, beds in those hospitals? Do I have the equipment needed to keep, uh, to sterilize this whole area? and how many can I process? So again, there's a capacity issue here. Then comes the consumables part. Do I have the consumables needed to treat uh, these patients uh, and also the healthcare practitioners, uh, what do they need to do the treatment? And uh, Charlie mentioned about masks. Uh, there are things which are needed like uh, disinfectants that we've talked about. And a rapidly emerging area of consumables is what medicines will actually work. So there are things like chloroquine people talk about, azithromycin and, and a lot of other people are working on that. So the first thing is, do I have access to that, right? So that, that's number one. Now, the point is that is not enough because you can have a ventilator, but you and I can't do anything with it. You need doctors. So the second part is the adoption part. Are there trained people who know enough about this science to be able to treat the patients? So do we have the doctors? Do we have the nurses? Do we have the support staff? Uh, and what are their numbers? And do we have enough of them, right? And I'll come to that enough part a little later. Because following from this third part is what I generally call awareness because in peace times, it is a, it's, it's quite a problem to get the patient to see a doctor because he doesn't really know what he has and all of that. In case of COVID, actually, this is a flood, right? It's, it's a huge number of patients coming through. And this is possibly the more complex part for us because here there are four types of people. One is you and me, everyone who is a patient who at the moment, uh, touch wood, doesn't have uh, COVID. Then you have people who have COVID who don't know they have COVID and they're going and spreading around the infection. Then there are people who have COVID but they are, and they're sick, but they're not sick enough uh, to need ventilators, but they need to be segregated into hospitals. And finally, you have the very sick people. Now these four segments, it's a very dynamic field. And one of the major tasks we have here is how do I control the number of patients so that I don't overwhelm capacity one and capacity two? Because the moment everyone gets sick, uh, it's going to be a challenge. And then finally, and which is something which is a lot in the news nowadays is, can we afford all of this? Do we have the capital equipment? Do we have the hospitals? We hear about these stories where China put up this hospital within you know, a few days. Uh, how will we get all that infrastructure? And you see um, in, in various countries, um, people are sort of uh, taking up um, infrastructure which uh, isn't hospital infrastructure. For example, in Singapore, uh, they started quarantining people in, in the stadium, in, in, in hotels, because you want to keep these four types of people separate from each other. The guys who are infected, not infected, sick, and really sick. You know, so how do you do that? So getting the money for that. And then uh, can the patients afford the treatment? Who pays for something like this? It's not the patients doing. And the challenge here is 
Uh, in normal times, what you would do is say, okay, I can afford a knee replacement, you know, uh, great, another one cannot, so he lives with the pain. Here you cannot do that, because if you leave a person alone, he will infect everyone else. So it's not so easy to say that if a patient can't afford it, he doesn't get the treatment. We have to find an answer. So that these, when you put these four elements together, the problem gets quite complicated. Now, Zelina asked this question as, how does this vary across countries? So quite frankly, and this is where the whole idea about stay at home and, and what governments are able to do earlier makes a difference. Because a lot of it depends on how many patients do you have, at what rate are they getting infected, have you acted in time or not? And people criticize China a lot, and nowadays people are criticizing the US. Same happened in, in Japan and Singapore, where initially we were quite okay. So like even up to last week in Singapore, people were going around as though nothing had changed. And then suddenly the numbers started going up. So since this Tuesday, everything has been put into a clam. There's a $300 fine, and the next uh, offense is much more. So people are trying to control the numbers. There. Because if you don't control it, none of the others will work. You don't have enough hospitals. You won't have enough ventilators. You don't have enough support staff. And these support staff start getting overwhelmed. So, uh, and, and if you don't have enough masks, then you won't have enough healthcare practitioners because they're getting infected. So it's a very dynamic problem. And at the same time, the science is evolving. People don't know what will work, whether chloroquine works, azithromycin works, and people come up with all sorts of things. So it's a pretty complex model, uh, you know, situation. But I would suggest that if you can break these out separately, think about the capital side of it and the consumable side of it in one way, look at those supply chains, and there are strategies to work on it. Maybe we can come to that when we talk about the next one. Then we talk about healthcare practitioners, and more, most importantly, how do we control the demand here so that the supply chain doesn't get overwhelmed. And I think, I look, in terms of that, um, controlling the demand, and that is why it's so important to stay at home and flattening the curve. Exactly. So right. I was, uh, yeah, so maybe we can talk about this at the moment. So when I talked about these four A's, surrounding these are the people who do it. So, so when it comes to healthcare, there are five P's, and these are the stakeholders. So when it comes to the access part, capital equipment, consumables, the providers are the hospitals who build the infrastructure, buy the capital equipment. There are pharma companies who ensure that medicines are supplied, and med tech companies who make the masks, the gowns, and you know everything else which is required, the beds. Uh, so, so the providers have become very important at this point. So the type of support, uh, so I'll come to that later. Then you have the physicians. How many do you have? What are their training levels? What type of support can we give to them? Then there are patients. What are their pathways? Uh, how do they reach the hospital? Uh, how are we able to separate them? And then finally the payers, uh, which could be income levels and reimbursement. What you find when something is like a COVID uh, pandemic uh, gets into play, the most important person, and I put that in the middle, is the policymaker, because he is the one who needs to move fastest so that these capacities don't get overwhelmed. Otherwise, those will be built under normal circumstances. A provider will never build a hospital to take care of millions of patients who are infected with a pandemic because the moment that pandemic is over, he has no, no use for it, right? Same way you don't build a physician team to take care of an infection. Uh, what is needed now is how do I get enough of these capacities to take care of where my country is from the patient point of view. So what the policymakers can do, for example, regulatory approval. So as soon as COVID uh, treatments are available, uh, how can they fast track uh, their approval. So, uh, for example, in the U.S. and the company I work with, Johnson Johnson, is at the foremost of, you know, at the cutting edge of that. They have said that a vaccine will be available somewhere in in, in Jan. Now, I'm sure FDA, the, everyone is working with them and you know, uh, rooting for them so that they can get it out as fast. In fact, the CEO went online and said, "I will make the stop, and then I'll wait for regulatory approval because it, it's such an urgent problem." But you need this cooperation, and they need to be able to do that. The other one I put there is diplomatic encouragement, because suddenly, if you remember, Trump, Trump was talking a lot about chloroquine and that being very important for patients. Uh, and India had put in a, a requirement that we are not going to export any drugs because we need it for our own people. And there's a bit of a tussle between them. A couple of tweets were exchanged, and then Modi finally decided, no, I'm going to send this because Trump really wants it. So again, the policymaker was very important. On their own, people couldn't have got access to it. Similarly, when it comes to physicians, I know Cuba sent a lot of doctors to Italy, uh, a lot of facts. So this is, you know, another type of, you know, uh, diplomacy where you're able to get help from outside because you yourself don't have enough healthcare practitioners. Um, the other thing which uh, uh, policymakers do here, and this was a very interesting tweaking you saw with the National Health Service in London, 
where uh, they didn't close down the schools. And the reason they didn't close down the schools is because it would affect the capacity of how many healthcare practitioners come to work. Nurses won't come to work if their children were at home. So it's, it's, it's a very intricate balancing act that they have to do. And no one really knows what is right, what is wrong. It all depends on how are the patients showing up, how is it getting there. Uh, about patients, we talked about it. So population movement, this is possibly the biggest contribution the government makes, uh, putting these concepts of lockdown, penalties and stuff. India has gone for 21 days and extended now up to 3rd of March where people have to stay at home and there are police outside making sure that, that, that they don't spread. So if you think about it, what has happened here is you've shifted the capacity required of healthcare practitioners to policemen, which you have a lot of, but, but they're keeping people healthy by making them stay at home by force because there's no time for education right now. If a country of 1.3 billion gets infected, no one on earth can uh, solve that. And similarly on affordability, what type of economic support, different countries are doing different things. The U.S. is actually giving people uh, money, especially the small and medium enterprises. Singapore is given $600 per, um, you know, citizen to take care of this period, which they call the circuit breaker. India is still debating whether testing should be free or not. The Supreme Court says it should be free. Then they say, no, it should be for uh, the poor people. So the, po the point here is it's a very dynamic situation. But the key thing here is trying to stem the patient flow so that the other capacities in the supply chain are not overwhelmed. Right. So thank you, Alo. So basically, the the keyword that I'm hearing from both of you is it's a complex system, Very. right? And you really need to think about and trace the whole, all the, the, the whole chain. That's why it's called chain. Um, so let me go to Charlie um, in terms of, you know, we talk about the supply chain, um, the weakest link, the building resilience. A lot of the question, I was just looking at the questions by our participants. I mean, what does that mean to us right now? And how do we build resilience? And how does each constituency can play a part? Okay, thank you, Zelina. So, so to sum up what I said earlier, in some sense, what I said was, uh, there's more stress on the demand side for the reasons that I explained, and there's more stress on the supply side for, for the reasons that I, uh, I explained. So, so we have greater demand and risk to supply, but how do, so how do we assure that we keep these chains running? And so to focus on food supply chain in particular, how do we make sure that we uh, can feed everyone in Malaysia and uh, that the government and industry together uh, can do that? And I want to kind of break that into two pieces. One, which uh, which relates maybe to international trade, that is how much food might go in and out of Malaysia, and then one might be just domestic. How, how do how do the domestic supply chains in in Malaysia work? So, so if you think about the domestic supply chains first, so the the picture that I showed earlier, going all the way from farms to uh, to, to transportation to markets to processing to uh, final to retailers and consumers, uh, I think it's important to first just to assess the supply and demand. What it, what, to map that supply chain that I described, uh, that if for each uh, commodity that we might have, we want to understand how the supply chain works and, uh, and where the weak links are, as I, as I mentioned earlier, and what the demand has been and what it's likely to be. So, so I think that's, that's uh, first point. Second point is, I think that uh, uh, the work has to be adjusted, as I mentioned, partly to protect workers, but probably we need more workers. That, that is, uh, the capacity is gonna have to be increased at a number of these points. And uh, that's not an instantaneous process. That On the one hand, we have many people who are being pushed out of work and losing their jobs or being put on unemployment. On the other hand, as I've described, I think the food supply chain actually is going to need more people because the productivity is going to go down. If you have to have the social distancing, if you have to have some people put into quarantine for periods of time, you're going to need more people in that chain. So uh, in the very short term, I think we want to think about how do we deploy more labor into this system in a safe way, uh, that the amount of labor that historically has been in this chain just left to itself uh, we'll have more challenges to deliver uh, the, the food required given the increased demand and the increased pressures on supply. So, so industry has to assess this, uh, understand their, their labor needs, their capacity needs, their demand needs, 
Uh, and then I think the government, though, also has a role to play. That that uh, to ask every farm to go out and procure masks for themselves, given the shortages of masks, to, to ask the farms to in, to overnight uh, provide uh, a more more uh, capacity for social distancing of the workers. Uh, the a lot of these are small farms. A lot of these are small operations that work their way up into the supply chain. And I think the government can help. So I put it under the government, help businesses strengthen the weak links. So if the weak links are, we need more labor, can the government help uh, uh, look at the labor situation? Who's being thrown out of work? Where can they be more helpful? What skills that we need in the food supply chains are actually being uh, underutilized in other supply chains and, and can be redeployed? Uh, I think the government also has a role to play in reducing the uncertainty. That I said earlier, uh, more uncertainty means people want to store more. They, they, they tend towards hoarding. So the government has to play a role. And I think the Malaysian government was very, very clear very early on saying, there's plenty of food for everybody. You don't have to strip the, the stores clean. We're going to be able to, to feed everyone. And I think the government has to reassure people of that, but then also back those words up by monitoring the supply chain, understanding where the weak links are, seeing where the private sector supply chain is struggling, uh, and then trying to add more capacity and more help. In some sense, in the same way that the government has brought the army in to help the police force to, to support the MCO, uh, the government needs to think about uh, these critical supply chains. Are there places that, that we can help, that we can help strengthen these weaker links? So that's all on the domestic side. If we think about the international trade, obviously Malaysia imports a certain amount of food and also exports a certain amount of food. Uh, some countries have, have reported that they're going to reduce exports. Other countries have increased their purchases from outside. Uh, broadly speaking, international trade tends to be good for feeding people, that, that it's, it's, it's helpful to be able to bring food into the country. And you look at, for example, Australia and New Zealand that might have a lot of dairy farms, for example, and some of that dairy uh, material uh, foods get brought to Malaysia. We wanna continue to have that be possible. And in exchange, uh, Malaysia needs to underscore the benefits of being able to, 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 to maintain trade uh, in food and medical products and other things. So, so that's another role a government can play is, is to try to reinforce the value of, of trade and being able to maintain these supply chains and get the support. Uh, I think on the consumer side, I put stay calm and stay home, right? So don't panic. I do think the Malaysian government has done a very, very solid job so far of managing this disaster. I think that the, uh, the stay at home policy, the MCO policy has been the right policy for Malaysia. It's been well enforced. And I think that that reinforces that people can, can feel comfortable and safe that they can stay home, stay calm if they stay home. Obviously, there are many people uh, who don't have comfortable homes, maybe, to, to be locked in and also can't work from home. And so uh, those people need support and uh, they need incomes. And, and uh, to the extent that the food supply chain may need more labor, it's worth trying to understand how to make that uh, go as well. So let me pause there. Uh, there's more to say, but, but we can maybe uh, get some more comments from Alok and, and Zelina, and then maybe take some, some of the questions. Thank you, Charlie. Um, Alok, do you want to um, say something before I move to the Q&A? Yeah, so I think uh, Charlie has uh, uh, covered quite a bit in that, but a couple of areas where I've seen uh, governments working and, and, and partnering very well with uh, providers uh, is to improve uh, the supply of uh, medical equipment. So for example, if you remember one of the biggest things being talked about uh, was, uh, was uh, these uh, uh, PPE and face shields and stuff. So I know that in Malaysia, Proton is uh, making 60,000 face shields um, uh, then you've got Foxconn in the U.S. making ventilators. Uh, many car companies have repurposed their lines to start making ventilators. So uh, the whole idea right now is that the world, for the first time, I guess, is working as a team, and we need to get as much help as possible to solve uh, some of these problems. Um, 
The other thing which I think uh, we need to do, do a bit more is uh, to keep uh, our healthcare workers safe. Because if we don't keep them safe, I think all of us will be in a lot of trouble. Because right now it is not about uh, you know uh, treating one patient. It's about how you treat a whole population. And the only way it can get back is if we can start identifying those people who've been through this, who have the antibodies, can go back to work safely. But being able to segregate these needs, very careful segmentation using testing, more testing for antigens, antibodies, and then keeping them separate till you can solve the problem. So I think there's a lot that the government can do. And at the moment, I think uh, most of the countries, I would say, are trying to do their best uh, to the extent they can, given their sizes and given, given their resources. Thank you, Alok. So you mentioned just now um, that the testing for the new drug or new vaccine will be quite a while, uh, and you know, the outlook is probably as as fast or next year, right? Yeah. So since we are looking at that, I'm just looking at the, some of the questions here. Basically, it's going to be a while. It's not going to be one or two months. So that, what that means is this is going to be a new normal for quite a while, for more at least more than six months or a year. So based on the a supply chain that Charlie and Alu have mentioned, both of you, um, would you like to offer your thoughts on how how can we recreate or reinvent the new business model for the supply chain? And there were a lot of questions from the participants about, um, yeah, we can reallocate the resources on the, the labor, like what Charlie mentioned, but sometimes what if these people are infected, right? How then we can utilize more of technology and to help um, lessen that impact and the risk. Charlie, do you want to start first? Sure, thank you. So, so I think one has to break this into what can we do immediately? Uh, what can we do in the short term that is maybe in the next few months? And what are some of the longer term things that we can do, right? So, so I was focused a little bit more on the immediate. Immediately, we need to protect the workers, we get masks to the workers, create more separation, try to find more labor where we, where we have problems, monitor the data, strengthen the weak links, that, that in the immediate term, it's gonna be hard to deploy technological solutions like more automation in food processing plants or, uh, or uh, self-driving trucks and things like that. I think, I mean, those reduce the labor, but, but those are not gonna be deployed in the immediate term, right? In the in the in the next, say, three to six months, uh, I think we we certainly can do uh, maybe a more comprehensive job of mapping these supply chains, of getting uh, better data on where are the weak links, on on where are the shortages, where the, where are the needs, uh, where can we uh, redeploy more workers, where where can we apply technology that that can make a difference. But um, but th we've got to sort of get things under control first, and un partly being under control is controlling the the health of of the people in the current chain. So I didn't mention test and trace earlier, but obviously, if you've got something like a food processing plant, uh, you want to know if anybody in that plant is infected because you don't want everyone in that plant to be infected. So so having a very uh, careful checking of the health. Uh, and health monitoring of all those workers in these critical chains is, crit is super important. Uh, and obviously, uh, my sense is around the world, hospitals are doing a really good job of this, that has hospitals are main, are, are have the capability and uh, the knowledge to be able to monitor consistently the health status of the people who work in the hospitals and work in the medical supply chains. I think the food supply chain more vulnerable in that sense because the food supply chain people are, are, aren't experts in, in monitoring the health of, of their workers and aren't experts in, in understanding uh, all the dimensions of the, the health concerns. So, so they need help there. The food supply chain needs help from the medical supply chain in some sense to keep their people uh, healthy. So, so th their technology can help, right? So uh, test and trace, monitoring who's sick, who's quarantined, uh, as Alok mentioned, who's already been through the disease and has antibodies so that they can safely go to work and not uh, be in, uh, worried about reinfection, uh, that can make a difference as well. So, so I think that's, that's an important component. Okay. 
Oh, you want to add something before I move on to the next question from the next one? You can go to the next one. I see we got a whole bunch of questions. Yep. Yeah. So what I like what about I this, this about um, there, there's a question about, you know, so what we've realized after COVID-19 uh, outbreak started, we all were pushed to accelerate our digital adoption, right? Digital transformation. And the case in point is this webinar where we actually have to go virtual. And that also means that we have to start thinking about paperless, contactless. And if and We've also seen um, some of the Cameron Highlands farmers that go straight to market via Lazada. And how do we, the question is, how do you adapt to the new normal? Is there anything else that, that you haven't covered in your in your discussion just now, Charlie, they want to offer. So there are probably uh, uh, millions of, of details. I, I do think, uh, I mean, if you if you mention something specific like the farmers in Cameron Islands, uh, I think it was well popularized that, that, that there was a situation where the, uh, the food was not able to be harvested uh, in time and. and uh, and that got brought to people's attention that that we need to make sure the supply chains are open, the transportation lines are open, as well as the harvesting people are open. So, uh, process uh, providing that information, having it centralized, having and then being able to deploy resources against identified shortages and challenges is part of what information technology can do well. I mean, I think more broadly. Uh, so prior to the COVID breakout, uh, there was a very strong theme in, in business writing broadly about uh, the replacement of human beings by automation. Right? And so uh, you might say, well, gee, if, if, uh, if all of our supply chains were already automated and all of our factories were already automated, then perhaps we wouldn't have uh, the problems that we have in supply chains today. But uh, I think uh, as people are realizing uh, humanity needs humanity. Uh, people need work. People need their social environment of work. Uh, and I don't know that everybody wants to be in a world where the robots do everything and the computers do everything for us. And so uh, I, I think we're seeing a very strong streak of people saying, uh, I want our human, I want humanity to come back to where it was and, and our social environments to, to be reestablished. And, and we don't want to all just live in our, in our own rooms uh, and, and live on our computers, if you will, and our phones, but we want to socialize and interact and work with other people. So, so I think we have uh, maybe some economic and technological uh, pushes towards more and more automation. Uh, but I think uh, we have a human, humanistic streak towards uh, wanting to balance that against uh, what people need to, to, uh, to be satisfied and to be happy with their lives. Yeah, and I agree with that in terms of um, the word is really augmentation, right? And how can technology help augment the processes but not taking away the human part of it? I think the question is more, because of the current situation, how do we then make sure? I, I like the the idea that you talk about. You know how you immediate term is we must protect our workers, right? The workers, the frontliners. That's the, the first thing we need to do, and be able to effectively test and trace and also quarantine them if we find one case. So that's super important to ensure that the first, the point, of uh, the supply does not get disrupted. I think that's super important. Um, so, Alo, do you want to add any more in terms of from the medical supply chain? Uh, you know, if there is any ways you mentioned all these complex parameters and also um, the how we also have to make sure that you know, how the UK schools have opened because they want to make sure the healthcare providers stay available, right? So, in, in your assessment, at least specific to this region. What are the one or two um, factors that you see lagging behind? And you mentioned just now that you need to control the demand. And I think we understand that. But from the supply chain, is there anything that you want to you find um, in the red alert situation? Nothing in particular. But what I find is uh, a very peculiar phenomenon nowadays. And you hear about it now and then, that medical supplies are being hijacked by the highest bidder. Now, that 
uh, does affect some of the countries in our region. Not everyone has got a, a high amount of income. So they have to start thinking about how do they take care of uh, you know, situations like this. And I've even uh, you know, been involved in some forums where looking at uh, is there a way of reprocessing some of the things which we normally consider as consumables? Can but can I re-sterilize mask versus someone going without a mask? You know, so 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 the, those are the type of choices people will have to make, and it all depends on the volume. And if it is manageable, you're okay. But the moment it overwhelms the healthcare system, the capacity, and the healthcare practitioners, I think there can be a huge amount of chaos. All these numbers we see, those ratios won't hold. Uh, so it's quite a serious situation, and I think. Uh, in some uh, uh, countries also I have seen that um, the government wasn't that quick to uh, really enforce, uh, you know, uh, stay at home type of policies and all of that. And that can uh, cost you quite a lot in terms of uh, what capacity you need. Right. So I think that is very important. The other thing I'd like to add is to the business model side is, I think, uh, and, and we on the medical side are very used to that. Uh, the rest of the world, uh, especially when it's using, uh, talking about supply chains where one thing is made for consumption by someone else, will need to start using the same type of protocols and processes which we, use, which we have been using for sterile products. That whole quality control system will have to start seeing not just whether someone was infected, but whether the infection has been passed over. So not just testing for human being, but testing in products. Has, is there, you know, a fomite there? Is there... Uh, some virus which has uh, been passed on to my canned food. I mean, we will have to think very differently and uh, to be safe in future. Uh, uh, and and it, it can be quite a different world. And I think that is where automation and other things come in uh, to look at those risky areas and maybe try to automate those while the others where the human touch is important can continue. I agree. And, and both of you uh, brought up a very important question um, issues, especially on the international trade and availability of the raw materials. I mean, we've seen the N95 mask being basically um, fully utilized and halted by the U.S. and you know that that left the Malaysian um, the front line is with two weeks worth of PPEs for the N95 mask. So this is real, right? So I think for um, for the participants and who, who are in the healthcare and the medical sector, I think it's also important to think about how else can we reinvent, like you, uh, you said, um, I look, you know, how do you then reprocess the consumables in absence of what the ideal model or ideal product is? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Um, on the third question, I, what I'm doing is I'm going yeah. through the top three, sorry, Charlie. No, I, I just wanted maybe to add a tiny bit more. So. I see we have a lot of really great questions, and I think what we'll have to do is some of them we'll answer in writing and we'll post them on our website afterwards yep. because we can't possibly address them all. Yep. But I see there's a couple here about rail transport, and I, I wanted to make one comment about rail transport, which in some sense you could think of rail, I think, is a more automated solution than trucks in the sense that you can, you can transport a lot more material with the same amount of labor uh, in a rail system as opposed to a, a trucking system because uh, rails just have higher capacity. And so in a time where uh, labor is a challenge and transportation is a challenge, uh, perhaps rail actually has a larger role to play. Uh, and, um, and and we should, we should be aware that having these multiple channels that is not dependent on just one channel, just trucks, for example, uh, is is critical, but uh, so you, you think about an automated system. Like so, I, I'm saying rail is more automated than than trucks. That is more higher productivity per person. But then the, the issue is uh, how important it is to protect each of those individual people who are on that chain because there are fewer of them, right? So think about any automated system has fewer workers. But each of those workers, in some sense, is more critical because they're controlling a larger amount of total uh, productivity. So that, so that says the more automated your systems are, the, the more critical every individual worker that you have is. And so you've got to spend even more uh, effort uh, a, a on protecting those people that you've got. Uh, because the people who tend these automated systems, if they go down and then, then you can't maintain the automated systems, then you're in even bigger trouble. So, so, uh, so I think that's something to think about with that automated systems maybe have more productivity, 
uh, but they're more fragile in the sense that if a small number of people go down in the automated system, the whole system may go down, whereas a, a labor-intensive system, you lose a small number of people, you have lots of labor that can keep it going. So, 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 so that's another consideration that one would want to think about with an automated system. Yeah, that's a good point and good add. Thank you, Charlie. And I'm, I'm mindful of the time. It just seems like the time flies by very quickly when we're having fun. And we are already at the end of the, the session. Let me, um, I didn't, I just wanna, sorry, I just didn't click the Q&A, but I think there's 34 questions. that are very good question. And we will try to um, um, collect them and also see what area that we can add more in, in terms of the article maybe after this. And just uh, before that, I just wanted to summarize um, uh, some of the key points that, that we've talked about um, today. You know, it's very clear that the, the stress that we see in the supply chain is because of that sudden increase in demand. That's, that's unprecedented. We, we did not foresee that. I mean, there's no way that you can always, you can plan this pandemic and also the availability of supply. And, and just to also reiterate Charlie's um, framework in terms of looking at the, the weakest link, that's important. And as, as we go through and re, re-look at, reassess our business model, in this sense, um, we talked about uh, the four A's framework for the medical supplies, and how, you know, when we look at this whole strategy going forward and how do we um, address the new normal, we need to bucket it into immediate terms where we just need to we need to make sure we protect the workers first, and and also then what's next in the three to six months and then six to one year's time, and how then we can adopt and implement technology and but also be mindful of the pros and cons of each technology versus labor cost. Um, so I think um, do you, for th these two panelists, Charlie and Alok, do you have any parting um, remark before we close the session? So uh, first of all, I want to thank Alok and Zelina uh, for being partners in this and also uh, Dr. Tan and our whole team for uh, putting this program together, and, and all of our all the participants who who logged in and, and listened, uh, uh, the main point I would reiterate is our supply chains are under pressure. Uh, that requires that we look carefully at them, we map them, we understand the weakest links, and we uh, have to work together, uh, industry and government, to uh, shore up those weak links and 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 uh, try to to put resources where 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 they're going to make the biggest effect to, to maintain the integrity of these chains. Yeah. So th thanks a lot, Charlie, for having me here, and uh, Zelina for uh, for getting me uh, on this panel. Uh, the only thing I'd like to say is from a medical point of view, quite frankly, uh, unfortunately, we are at the very beginning. Uh, we don't even have a treatment at the moment. All efforts are at the moment uh, focused on trying to uh, keep people safe and more on preventive. Uh, but we don't really have a treatment. Uh, and when we do have that treatment, talking about a world with 7 billion people, that is going to be an unimaginable supply chain issue. How do you produce? How do you get these people to get vaccinated? And how do you then make the whole world safe? So unfortunately, we're right at the beginning of, of some of these areas, and it's it's not going to be easy. But all I can say is, as far as everyone on this panel and this uh, session is concerned, stay safe and spread the me uh, message around that uh, we need to try our best that we don't fall sick. Thank you, Alok. With that closing remark, uh, it's, it's super important that we all play our part and stay home and stay safe and making sure that we don't overload the capacity of our hospitals, right? And, and we are hopeful. People say that crisis is also opportunity. So we're hopeful that the vaccine can be found or you know, the, the whole, the global medical and scientists are working around the clock to, to make sure and to go find this, this vaccine and, and to think about how we can then, um, after this, to distribute the supplies of this vaccine is also another consideration. So thank you for um, highlighting that as well. 
Um, so before we end this session, I just wanted to um, ask for participants' um, assistance to also um, do the survey link. Um, there's a so to answer the survey. We have a survey link here on the on the screen especially as we build um, a more session in the future. So it will be very helpful. In fact, one of the sessions that we have, I mean, all the sessions we have here are also based on the feedback from the past participants. So we really appreciate all your questions. I'm sorry, I can't really cover all 38 good questions here, but we will aim to summarize them and share with all of you after this. Um, we'll stay tuned for the next session next week and Stay safe and have a good day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.